This video is brought to you by Ridge. I'm going to tell you more about them and their exciting offer a little bit later. Two armies throwing everything they have into a single city. For Hitler, this was a crucial step in advancing deeper into the Soviet Union. For Stalin, it was about halting the German advance in the city of his namesake and turning the tide of war by any means possible. This was the Battle of Stalingrad, widely regarded as not just the bloodiest battle of the Second World War, but the bloodiest battle of all time. Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, had seen dramatic success early on as more than three million troops stormed across the Baltics, Belarus, and Ukraine in a three-pronged attack with thundering speed, all while inflicting immense casualties on both their enemies and the civilians blocking their path. But pushing deeper into Russia proved to be much harder, and being held off from Moscow was a slap in the face to the German war machine, who had hoped to defeat Stalin in that single grand operation. As this operation ground to a crawl, Hitler began taking personal control over more and more of the military's affairs and personally drafted the objectives for 1942. Instead of launching a second attempt to take Moscow, he turned his attention to the Soviet Union's south, to the Caucasus. It was here that Germany could capture the Soviet Union's oil fields, which were desperately needed by the Third Reich as their fuel supplies were draining much faster than they could be refilled. The plan to capture these oil fields was codenamed Case Blue, and it involved Army Group South, a regiment that had steamrolled Ukraine the year prior. Originally, the plan was to essentially head straight for Baku, Azerbaijan, but things started changing when Hitler began redrawing objectives. Under his new plan, Army Group South would split into two groups, A and B. Group A would continue heading southward to the oil fields as previously planned, but Group B was to head deeper east, all the way to the edge of the Caspian Sea, which would isolate Caucasia from the rest of the USSR. Overall, the operation would involve more than 1.3 million Axis soldiers, a few hundred thousands of which were actually not German, but rather Italian, Romanian, Croatian, or Hungarian. Case Blue was supposed to begin in May 1942, but it had to be postponed when many of the units involved were still busy in Crimea besieging Sevastopol and didn't actually begin until late June. But when it did start, it saw the same immediate success that so many German advances had seen in the years leading up to this. The Soviets, who had been anticipating another attack on Moscow, were completely caught off guard by the push into southern Russia, and the Germans advanced so quickly that they encircled several Soviet positions before they even had a chance to surrender. Render. Each time, a defensive line was hastily set up, but the Germans were so quick, they would outflank it every time. So let me interrupt today's video to tell you that, well, Father's Day is just around the corner. If you're anything like me, finding the perfect gift for dad can be a bit tricky, but don't worry because Ridge have absolutely got your back. This is the last wallet you will ever need. It holds cards, it holds cash, it can hold up to 12 cards actually, although like a regular person, like just have two bank cards and an ID in there, but as I understand it, people have library cards and loyalty cards and all the other stuff that I just don't seem to have. But uh, plenty of space for all of the cards, plus that cash, and it remains nice and slim and compact. That old leather wallet that you've been carrying around in your back pocket since you were a child is no more with Ridge. And plus, if you're tired of keys jangling around in your pocket, listen to how much jangling goes on with this. None. This is the Ridge key case, and it's like a Swiss army knife for keys. They fold out very easily, and then you just grab which one you want. Like, I want my office key, like outside office. Boom, easy. I want the post box key. Boom, easy. It's perfect. And if you buy the Ridge wallet and the key case together, you can save up to 30% on your order. But wait, there's more Ridge products are designed with RFID blocking technology to protect you from digital pickpockets. And there's over 30 different colors and styles to choose from. This is the carbon fiber one. The one I'm using right now is the titanium one. The key case actually matches up with the carbon fiber one. Plus, Ridge has a sale just in time for Father's Day. By using my unique link, ridge.com forward slash warographics, you can save up to 40% on your purchase through June the 10th. Don't wait, because this sale is for a limited time only. So head over to ridge.com slash warographics and find the perfect gift for your dad today. And don't forget, Ridge is so confident that you'll love their products, they're offering a 99-day test drive and a lifetime warranty. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below, get the best deal on Ridge products. And now back to today's video. After just a couple of weeks, the city of Stalingrad was within reach, and Hitler ordered it to be captured. 
Stalingrad wasn't originally the main objective of this operation, but there were a few reasons that Hitler viewed it as important. Its capture would secure Group A's flank. As they headed toward the Caucasus, it would deprive the Soviet army of many of the weapons factories and other industrial facilities there, and it would grant Germany complete control over the mighty Volga River. It also served as a railway hub for American supplies in the Lend-Lease program, which would prove vital to the Soviet Union's survival in the war. And the icing on the cake was that the city was named after Stalin, and its defeat would be a bit of a kick in the teeth to Soviet morale. As the Germans marched toward Stalingrad like a hot knife through butter, Hitler decided that Case Blue was going so well that the 4th Panzer Army wasn't going to be needed at Stalingrad, so he ordered them to join Group A, which was heading south. A massive traffic jam ensued as thousands of vehicles clogged up the roads trying to change direction, a traffic jam so bad that it likely stalled the advance into Stalingrad by an entire week. And it was... A complete waste of time too, because when Hitler saw the mess that it made, he changed his mind and told the 4th Panzer Army to just go to Stalingrad anyway. Typical dictator stuff. Now, the slight delay gave the Soviets a bit of time to regroup, and as factories churned out tanks like never before and bullets were being made like candy, Joseph Stalin took measures to make sure that Stalingrad would not fall. He issued Order Number 227, an order to all Red Army soldiers and officers to hold their ground no matter what, containing the famous phrase, not a step back. To enforce this policy, blocking detachments were placed at the rear of all armies with orders to execute or imprison anyone who turned to flee. In just the first three months that Order Number 227 was given, more than 20,000 men would be sent to labor camps for violating it, though these numbers would drop off significantly as the war progressed. Though this order only applied to soldiers, the 400,000 or so civilians were stuck in the city as well, when Stalin refused to have it evacuated at first, believing that this would motivate the city's defenders to fight harder. So with the Soviets standing their grounds and the Axis heading straight for them, the stage was set for Stalingrad to turn into an absolute meat grinder. As the Axis forces caught their first glimpse of Stalingrad in late August, things were already looking dire in the city. Almost all food and other supplies had already been shipped across the Volga River, leaving the population in an immediate food shortage as the fighting began. But that was soon going to be the least of their worries. Before advancing on foot, the Germans commenced a bombing of Stalingrad that would last for several days, leveling much of the city and striking supply ships that were trying to reach the area. At one point, more than a thousand tons of bombs were dropped in less than 48 hours. The Soviet Air Force didn't stand much of a chance here as they lost 200 aircraft in the last week of August alone, unable to save more than 40,000 civilians that were killed in the devastation below. As the bombing went on, Stalin called up hundreds of thousands of reserves, pulling in men from all corners of the Soviet Union, piling them up on the east bank of the Volga River, readying them to replace losses inside the city if necessary. And inside the city, between the bombings, everyone was put to work, including women and children who dug trenches and set up fortifications for the city's defenders. By early September, the major bombing campaign was largely over, aside from coordinated airstrikes, and Axis forces were steadily marching toward the city, hoping to encircle and besiege it. But before they even reached its outskirts, they encountered fierce Soviet resistance. You see, Stalingrad had a bit of an odd shape, looking more like a line that hugs the Volga River. This would prevent the Germans from being fully able to encircle it, though they still aimed to control it from at least three sides. As the Germans advanced in the north and the south of the city, Soviet armies came out to meet them, fighting desperately by any means available. But despite some early successes, these counterattacks did little more than slow the assault that was underway, and soon Stalingrad was being hit. Axis artillery units fired endless barrages into the Soviet buildings and streets, which returned fire with multiple rocket launchers. When the enemy was finally within range of the city's defenders, all hell broke loose. The 1077th Anti-Aircraft Regiment and all-women volunteer squad turned their AA guns on advancing panzers, surprising the German armor who had to regroup and individually destroy each of the 37 guns before being able to move forward. Local militias made of workers from all professions were hastily thrown together and sent into battle, and despite the war on their doorstep, tanks continued to be produced, often made with spare tractor parts and lacking any gun sights. But those details didn't matter because there simply wasn't time. If it could shoot, it was sent into battle. 
September 1942 saw the beginning of the horrific urban combat that Stalingrad would be infamous for. As Germans stormed into the city, the fighting turned into vicious door-to-door -door battles, often in close quarters, with city blocks being captured, liberated, and captured again repeatedly. The Luftwaffe made it difficult for reinforcements to enter the city as well. Like we said earlier, ferries crossing the river were sitting ducks for German dive bombers, and tanks were easy pickings. On the 18th of September alone, 41 Soviet tanks were knocked out by German airstrikes. But if there's one thing that epitomizes the Battle of Stalingrad, it's that losses such as these were simply an everyday occurrence. Despite the danger, ferries full of Soviet soldiers crossed the Volga regularly, charging in to relieve their comrades' positions or to bring much needed food and ammunition. Across the ruined city, casualties were immense for both sides as the fighting intensified. For example, the Soviet 13th Guards Rifle Division was assigned to counterattack the city's railway station. But by the end of their assault, only 320 remained of the original 10,000 strong division. Battles raged all day long for Mamey of Kurgan, a prominent hill that overlooks much of the city, and even the sewers became battlegrounds as both sides attempted to use them as passageways under the city. As both sides pushed and counterattacked multiple times a day, it wasn't uncommon to see German and Soviet soldiers controlling different floors of the same crumbling building, firing at each other through holes in the floor and rigging explosives at every turn. As the weeks went by, German momentum was gaining in the southern portion of the city. One of the last strongholds in the area, a grain elevator, fell under siege for several days. About 50 Red Army soldiers defended this position, but they did it so fiercely that when it was finally captured, the Germans were shocked to see the number was so few, having expected hundreds of warriors. As the few survivors retreated from the grain elevator, they lit much of it on fire, depriving the Germans of crucial food. By the end of September, nearly the entire southern part of Stalingrad was firmly under Axis control, but there were still pockets of Soviet holdouts, as well as intense fighting in the center of the city, where the Red Army stubbornly resisted any further advances. One of the most stubborn strongholds was known as Pavlov's House, a four-story building in the center of Stalingrad that was transformed into an absolute fortress. It was surrounded on September the 27th, manned by around 30 men from the 13th Guards Rifle Division, the one that had already seen such enormous losses. Led by Sergeant Pavlov, the men planted mines, fortified walls, and set up machine gun and anti-tank nests overlooking every possible angle into the streets below. Resupplied only through a narrow strip of controlled territory to the Volga, Pavlov's house held their ground for two straight months, taking out so many enemy tanks and soldiers that Vasily Choykov, commanding general of the forces fighting in Stalingrad, jokes the more Germans lost their lives trying to take Pavlov's house than they did taking Paris. As October began, the focus of the war began shifting more to the northern sector of the city, the industrial heart of Stalingrad, as the Germans hoped to capture the remaining third of the city by cutting off the supply lines from the rivers, which would allow them to encircle any remaining forces on the west half of the Volga. This was much easier said than done, however, as the Soviet tactics were a bit of a tough egg to crack. The German tactics involved their traditional mixed arm strategies, relying on coordinated airstrikes, artillery, and tanks supported by infantry, which had served them well thus far in the war. However, Stalingrad was a new battleground. The Red Army defensive network was made up of numerous five to ten man units, each of which covered a floor, office, basement, or street corner, and turned them into little miniature fortresses. Because of their relatively small size, these units were highly mobile and could retreat, advance, or reposition as necessary, and waves of fresh recruits ensured that for every man lost, another quickly took his place. Along with this, Tchaikov had instructed the Red Army to hug the enemy, a tactic where they would press as close as possible to the Axis forces, preventing the Luftwaffe from providing air support unless they hit their own men. Snipers were also heavily employed by both sides, as they allowed for critical targets like artillery spotters to be taken out from a distance. The most successful sniper from the Battle of Stalingrad was Vasily Zayetsev, is a Navy clerk who had volunteered to be transferred to the front line after the German invasion. Using rubble to conceal his body and scouts to watch his back on the chaotic streets, he would emerge from Stalingrad with 225 confirmed kills and be awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union. Thanks to Zayetsev and the rest of the Red Army, the remaining pockets of Soviet soldiers held strong, and the second week of October saw a brief pause in German advances to catch their breath. Continuing the advance was only getting harder and harder as the city's destruction had turned the streets into an endless labyrinth of snipers, machine guns, landmines, with no predictable way to know where the enemy was among all the leveled buildings. But still, slowly and surely, the Germans 
they pressed on. Paving the way with thousands of casualties, the Wehrmacht crawled through the debris until by mid-November, the Soviets held only a tenth of the city, a fortified stretch of buildings along the river. The Red Army was literally hanging on by a thread, but the Germans simply couldn't cut that thread. They were too exhausted, too low on supplies, and they lacked the manpower. Not to mention temperatures had started to drop as Hitler had once again gotten himself in a nasty war with a third combatant, General Winter. The fighting continued sporadically, with neither side able to make tangible progress. But the Soviets, teetering on the edge of defeat, were about to turn the Battle of Stalingrad into one of their greatest victories of the entire war. By mid-November, the Battle of Stalingrad had been raging for about three months, and while the Soviets were slowly losing their grip on the city, Soviet commanders had been planning a counterattack for weeks. This counteroffensive was codenamed Operation Uranus, a gargantuan assault that aimed to first overwhelm the Axis forces in the north and south, and then encircle the remainder before liberating Stalingrad. For Operation Uranus, 1.1 million men had been gathered, along with more than 800 tanks, more than 13,000 pieces of artillery, and more than 1,000 aircraft. All the while, the Red Army had been engaged in a game of deception, building fake bridges and sending false radio messages to distract from the real time and location of the impending attack. After being postponed a couple of times, Operation Uranus began on November the 19th, 1942, just a week and a half after the Allies landed in occupied North Africa. After heavy artillery and a rocket bombardment on the northern side of Stalingrad, the Red Army rushed across the Don River, heading for the Romanian Third Army. The Romanians defended their positions here initially, but their lack of effective anti-tank weapons meant that the hundreds of Soviet T-34s steamrolled through the countryside. By the end of the first day, 27,000 Romanians had been captured on the northern flank, and nearly all the rest were on the run. The next day, the attack began on the southern front, as the Red Army crossed the Volga and encountered more Romanian divisions guarding the Axis flank. These divisions also fell quickly, though they were reinforced by German divisions, preventing a total encirclement as the front line collapsed and the Soviets pushed through. More Romanians were taken prisoner here as well. Operation Uranus continued at full steam, and in just a couple of days, several points of the front line had been pushed back nearly 50 kilometers or 31 miles. Things were not looking good for Germany, to say the least. Despite destroying dozens of tanks and aircraft, they were not only outnumbered, but they were exhausted after months of fighting, or while many of the Soviets were fresh recruits. Racing through the war-torn fields and villages, the northern and southern flanks of the Red Army pushed west, and after just four days, they linked up in the city of Kalaj, completing a Soviet ring around Stalingrad. The Axis forces, still numbering in the hundreds of thousands, were now completely trapped. The tables had been turned, and the Germans were now the ones trapped in the city. Facing the reality of the situation, General Friedrich Paulus, commander of the German forces at Stalingrad, urgently asked Berlin for orders, requesting the freedom to organize a breakout with the remaining men and supplies. But Hitler didn't seem to understand just how dire the situation was in Stalingrad, and was convinced that Paulus could hold his ground if the Luftwaffe airdrop supplies. These supply drops would create an air bridge that would allow the Germans to hold onto the city until a relief force could arrive. Hitler ignored all objectors and ordered the airlift to begin, despite estimates that the men in Stalingrad would need 700 tons of supplies every single day, and the Luftwaffe asserted that they simply did not have the capability to do that. Regardless, the decision had been made, and transport planes and modified long-range bombers began daily trips to drop supplies in Stalingrad. On average, 85 tons were brought in each day, significantly less than these 700 needed. And to make matters worse, the priority in these early shipments was fuel and ammunition, not food, as the men so desperately hoped for. As the brutality of winter set in, thousands would die from a combination of hunger and the cold, including Soviet prisoners, who were forced to cannibalize the dead just to survive. The air bridge took another hit when a Soviet tank division stumbled across the Tatsinkaya airfield, one of the German bases that was resupplying Stalingrad where they destroyed dozens of aircraft and recaptured the base. This meant that the Germans would now have to fly even further, meaning fewer supplies reached the besieged men who were about to be in for the fight of their lives. On December the 12th, German High Command initiated Operation Winter Storm, the relief plan to break the siege. In Hitler's mind, this would not only be a mission to save the men trapped in Stalingrad, but also to hold the city and keep it for future operations in 1943. Though, as always, this ambition 
would be his downfall. The German 4th Panzer Army, supported by the 3rd and 4th Romanian armies, clashed with Soviet forces southwest of Stalingrad, and despite some early successes, they were unable to break the Red Army siege, hampered by the cold and the size of the Red Army. Though it had attracted the attention of Soviet commanders, who sent further reinforcements to Stalingrad and began squeezing the German pocket like a python crushing its prey. Throughout December, thousands of Germans died of frostbite, untreated wounds, and hunger. In January, they didn't fare much better. As the Soviets pressed the city even harder, the Luftwaffe supply drops became infrequent as their planes were being shot down and the aircraft were hard to service in the winter. At this point, General Paulus begged Hitler for permission to surrender as the Soviets had offered him the chance, but his request was denied again and again. The stress of the situation was so severe that Paulus developed an unceasing tick in his left eye, which would spread to cause half of his face to uncontrollably twitch. As the horse meat ran out, the remaining Germans spent their time scrounging the streets for scraps of food, and as their ammunition ran out, so did their hope of ever escaping the city that they'd destroyed. On the 26th of January, the remaining Germans were split into two pockets, one in the north of the city and one in the south. Two days later, one of these pockets was split in two once more. On the 30th of January, Hitler was informed that Stalingrad would likely fall within the next couple of days, so he issued a wave of promotions to his field officers, most notably promoting Paulus to General Field Marshal. His intentions were crystal clear, as he also commented that no German or Prussian General Field Marshal had ever surrendered. If Paulus were to surrender, he would be the first to bring shame to the prestigious rank. Paulus was supposed to fight to the very last bullet, but he didn't. As the pockets collapsed, Paulus was captured along with 22 other generals and 91,000 wounded and sick Axis troops, only 5,000 of which would ever return to Germany. The rest would die in labor camps or succumb to the elements. Still, after all this, despite fighting in a brutal siege of starvation and frostbite, Hitler was upset with Paulus and claimed that he, quote, could have freed himself from all sorrow and ascended into eternity and national immortality, but he prefers to go to Moscow. Though Stalingrad had been officially liberated, small holdouts of German soldiers remained in the city for another month or so, and resources had to be allocated to flushing them out, which was difficult as the city was unrecognizable at this point, just an impossibly large heap of dirt, concrete, and bricks. It was a guerrilla fighter's dream. Soviet reports show that 2,400 Germans were killed in this phase of the battle and another 8,000 captured, uh, most caught living in the city's sewers. When all was said and done, the Battle of Stalingrad was a decisive Soviet victory. The Axis had suffered 800,000 casualties and had lost 900 aircraft and only 500 tanks. And that's only what got destroyed. A Soviet report showed that the Red Army had also captured a further 750 aircraft, 1,600 tanks, and thousands of trucks and other armored vehicles. All these losses for absolutely nothing in return. To achieve their historic victory, the Soviets had also paid the price in blood, suffering 1,129,619 total casualties, along with 2,600 aircraft and more than 4,300 tanks. This brings the total casualties for the entire battle, including killed, wounded, and missing on both sides, to over 2 million people, perhaps as high as 2.5 making it the deadliest battle in all of history. It's really even hard to grasp the scale of destruction that happened at Stalingrad. After all, there were more Soviet casualties in this battle than in the entire American Civil War. But its significance cannot be understated. The success at Stalingrad was a pivotal moment on the Eastern Front. The Germans had suffered massive casualties and a huge blow to their morale and had lost nearly all the progress from the successful Case Blue. It's unthinkable to imagine what would have happened if things had gone differently. Hitler lost thousands upon thousands of experienced and battle-hardened soldiers in Stalingrad, having doomed them when he refused to withdraw when it was clear the victory was out of reach. If those men and those supplies could have withdrawn and stayed in the war, they might have made a Soviet counter-offensive in the East much more difficult. Imagine if Churchill had refused to evacuate Dunkirk and had instead instructed his men to hold their ground, the very last man. It would have been disastrous. Hitler's ego had gotten in the way of reason once again, and the public was finally made aware of this mistake at the end of January 1943. German sentiment for the war was already sinking, 
and this only made it worse, with talks of total war now circulating and an uncertain future on every front. But for the Allies, this was the greatest news in many years. Morale surged among the British and the Americans, who no longer had to fear German invasions into the Middle East, and were now making steady progress in North Africa. The UK forged the sword of Stalingrad and presented it to Stalin later in Tehran. And the Daily Telegraph announced that Stalingrad had saved European civilization. But above all, the Soviets now had hope. Up until this point, they had been on the run, losing territory with every German operation and being forced to retreat further into the depths of their massive nation. But with the victory of Stalingrad, there would be no more retreating, and the motivated Red Army was now in position to press this momentum and turn the tide on the Axis powers.